Good evening, everyone. That sucks. Tell me all about all this great UMass stuff and go, good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Uh, that's what I want to hear. That's what I want to hear. You come all this way for that. Uh, it is really a great honor to be here with you uh, this evening to celebrate uh, 40 years of Tom's incredible contributions here to uh, the legacy of the power in class. Uh, but, but before we get started, just you applaud for that. Yeah. Uh, but before we get started, I'm, I'm one of these truth and advertising guys. You know, I believe in truth and advertising. And so there was advertising for this event tonight that said that I was going to come up here and talk about music and arts education and why it's important in everyone's life and blah, 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 right? But I'm going to leave the programming up to all of you. So I can go on and on about music and arts education and why it's important in every child's life and blah, 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 blah. Or I can talk about Mr. Han. Oh, yeah. So music and arts education, Hannah. That is not the response I was expecting. What do you have? Now there are there are a few things that are longer than Tom's time here at UMass, and one of those things is the relationship that Tom and I share. We've known each other for 41 years. Um, and we've had various stages in our relationship together. First it was teacher, student, uh, then mentor, apprentice, uh, writing partners and collaborators, uh, employee and employer when I was at Pearl. Uh, and we were, when we were facing crossroads in our lives, we were confidence for one another. Uh, in fact, Tom was uh, the best man in my wedding. <laughs> Check out those glasses, huh? But most importantly, Tom has always been my friend. So uh, this evening, I, what I want to do is to share some insights from our, this time together, maybe reveal a few things that you may not know about this legendary individual, and then outline how all these pieces kind of fit together and the threads that bind them all. Uh, well, first of all, Thomas Patrick Hannum. Right? Thomas P. Hannum, or as I would always call him, Right. He is the son of Stella Smagala and Robert Hanna. Bob was an English Irishman and Stella is very Polish. He grew up with a sister and brother in Parkside, Pennsylvania. Or is it up here? Is it, is it Parkside? Right? Parkside. Uh, but he grew up in a modest home. But did you know that he attended a Catholic church? Attended the Catholic school. It kind of explains some things right there, doesn't it? <laughs> you know, when he was in high school, he actually got a varsity letter. Anyone want to guess what he got it in? It's yeah. baseball. Track and field. Track. Javelin. Basketball. Bowling. <laughs> He's a, he's a Catholic school bowler. <laughs> now, thankfully for the rest of us, Tom just did not decide to follow his passion for bowling. Um, and instead, music took him down this pathway. In fact, uh, his father was a co-founder of a group called the Brookhaven Crusaders. Uh, and Tom was involved in percussion at an early age. In fact, uh, in this is 1970, Brookhaven Crusaders Eastern State Championships, which they won. Woo! And this guy, well, this little guy right here, is Tom Hannum playing snare drum under the direction of his first instructor, 
Joe Morella. And Joe sends his regard and wishes you all the best for this evening. Joe was his first teacher. But the Keystone Regiment would go on to, uh, in 1974, merge with the 507 Hornets, and they would create what is now known as the Crossmen. And Tom is a charter member of the Crossmen uh, and spent his first four years playing snare drum there. But while he was there, he went on to Westchester State College. And there he majored in history and taught the drum line. And his first drum major was George Parks. Right? You're starting to figure it out now, huh? George Parks was his drum major in, in college. But he quickly learned that history was not his thing, so he decided to switch to music education. And that's where our intersection begins. For me, it was August of 1978. And I was at home, and I was sat, uh, channel surfing of all six channels that we had at the time, <laughs> right? And I came across, went to PBS to see what was the DCI World Championships, 1978 DCI World Championships. Now, I didn't know what any of this stuff was, but the core coming on the field was the Crossmen from Delaware County, Pennsylvania. And I thought this was so cool because they, they put a close up on the drum line, and when they did that, the drumline's faces were painted like Kiss, right? See? And this guy, that's Hannah. Again, check out the cheaters on that guy, right? Well. I thought that was so cool, and then I had the opportunity to see them perform that fall at the Westchester Band Competition when I was a senior in high school. And we saw them perform, and after they performed, they talked about the fact that we're recruiting for new members, and we're going to have open auditions at Marple Newtown High School. So I turned to my best friend in high school, Scott Kelly, and I said, Scott, we've got to go try this out. Now, I didn't turn to Scott because I thought that he would actually make the core. Uh, I turned to him because he had a car. <laughs> So that I couldn't get there. So, but as we start going, uh, we, we were driving down to Marple Newtown High School, and Scott gets lost. And so, oh my God, we're, we're, we're late getting into rehearsal. So we, we finally pull into the, to, to the parking lot, and we go running inside, and there Chris Thompson looks at us, and he says, guys, go out to the truck and just get a drum and come back. So. Scott and I go running to the drum, to the truck, we open up the drawer, and there was a 36-inch bass drum and a 32-inch timpani. And because I played timpani in high school, I drew the short straw. So Scott got the bass drum, I got the timpani, we go back inside and we start doing eight on a hand. So we're doing the chup chups, right? Chup, 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 chup. So we're doing the eight on the hands, and we stop, and this short guy with big glasses comes walking up to me and he peers over his glasses and I'm waiting for him to say something profound, right? You know, we know how, how verbose Mr. Hannon is. <laughs> so I'm waiting for him to say something profound to me. He looks over his glasses, first thing he ever says to me, don't be late. <laughs> I wish I had a dollar for every time Tom and I use that phrase on one another. Uh, whether it's at rehearsals or uh, the ways that we would deploy it personally or professionally or musically, but most often mockingly when we would deploy that on some of our, our members. Now Tom was in charge of the Crossman drumline in 1979 for one reason. The drum line the prior year, the drum staff, they all quit. So he's the last man standing. So it was Tom Hanneman and Chris Thompson, 21 years of age, they're running a DCI finalist drum line. Right? Amazing. Just incredibly amazing. So it forced him to evolve. 
and it forced him to change and evolve with his skills with the opportunities that were in front of him. And as he evolved, our relationship evolved. So first, that was me in 1979 carrying a 32-inch timpani. <laughs> Isn't that the stupidest thing you've ever seen? <laughs> to this day, I can't raise my right hand any higher than this. <laughs> so, after, after doing that for a year, I went to Tom and I said, man, this is, this is dumb, we can't do this anymore. I mean, could you put them down on the ground? I'll play all of them, just don't make me carry them, right? <laughs> and so he did. So for the last three years, I was able to play the timpani when they were sitting down. But something happened along the way. And something that happened to me that's happened to many of you as well. He would start giving me responsibility to do stuff. No, really, a little bit at a time. First he gave me responsibility for the cymbals, and then he gave me responsibility for the keyboard players in 1982, my senior year. So uh, our relationship started to evolve. Now, after Tom graduated from Westchester in 1980, following his second year teaching the Crossman, George Parks recruited him to come to UMass, and thus began Tom's UMass journey. Now, add you, Bob. Yeah, he wasn't planning on staying. He came here because George asked him, he was going to earn some money, get his teaching assistant, do his master's degree, and then move on to whatever else was next. After the 1982 season, Tom was recruited by the Garfield cadets to leave the Crossmen and go to Garfield uh, to teach their percussion section. And I was shocked when Tom called me, I was down at Memphis State, he called me and said, hey, why don't you come with me? It'll be cool. And I just, you know, I was just aged out. I didn't know any better from anything else. He goes, yeah, come on up. So I went up and for $500 for the whole summer, no lie, no, wait, 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 let's get this straight. And I didn't get paid. Five, we're gonna pay you $500. No, they didn't. Still waiting for that check to clear. So, so we go, <laughs> but what was interesting is neither of us were really aware of what we were about to get into. We weren't aware of what we signed up for. And quite honestly, that's really a good thing because we really did not know what we were not supposed to do. We didn't know what we couldn't do. And that gave us the freedom to do things differently. And at the time, at, at the cadets, something different was going on. They had a horn line that played differently, unlike anything else we saw. They had a guard that was in, in, integrating modern dance and ballet into their work. And the drill was something unlike anything we'd ever seen before and created these ridiculous demands on the drum line that had never been done before. You see, in the 1970s, drum lines basically did an elevator drill, right? They moved up and down the 50-yard line, right? And when they played, they stopped and played. They stood and played, and then when they moved, they didn't play, okay? So the whole idea of now we were at the cadets, and the drummers, they had them running. I mean, they're not marching up and down. They're running in the drill. And not only that, but they're running sideways, right? You ever try to run sideways with a drum strapped around you? Yes. Yes, right, right? My mistake, I'm dating myself, right? All right. Yes, you have. Well, the reason why you do that is because Tom had to figure out how to make that happen. And it wasn't until that year that he figured out not only how to make them do that, but also to realize that we couldn't play the same way, we couldn't do the notes the same way, that the, approach, that, that the music did not call for it and the drill would not allow it. So Tom evolved. We evolved and became committed to a more musical approach to scoring the battery and a new approach for the keyboards. We came up with the idea of blending the battery percussion on the field with a concert percussion ensemble in the front. We put those together and thus the name Front Ensemble. And it was that that began to change what was happening uh, in the world of drum corps. 
And we did interesting thing with the things with the cymbal players as well that others had not done, both musically and vi visually. Now that began the, the multi-year transition between old school drum corps and contemporary drum corps. So this is what it looked like. This is a drum line in 1980, okay? Marching timpani, marching keyboards, drum line on the 50 yard line, right? That's 1980. This is a, the drum corps in 1985. Front ensemble filled with percussion instruments, battery running across the back. Totally different. Literally changed the face of the activity over those few years. Now, after we worked together at Garfield my first year, Tom convinced me to transfer to UMass for what ended up being one year uh, to help him with his thesis on the incredibly thought-provoking, stimulating, and world-changing topic of marching symbols. <laughs> Even Tom could do it, right? Now, I was probably the only person whose last name was not Zildjian that actually gave a shit about this. <laughs> so when I was there, I was able to see firsthand the beginnings of the transformation to the program at UMass. We worked on, Tom worked on developing the front ensemble and bringing in the new cymbal techniques and the new contemporary process to the marching percussion. And actually we did a couple of arrangements together uh, and including what I believe are the first arrangements of Birdland. Any of you play that before, right? Yeah. And 1812 Overture. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So I went to my first UMass football game in the fall of 1984, and I was surprised by yeah, right? And I was surprised by the fact that at the end of the game, everyone's still standing in the stadium. And I'm like, I went to Tom, I'm like, what the hell is everyone waiting for? You know, get out of the stadium, right? He goes, no, 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 they're here for the band. I'm like, wow, they're here for the band. I had never heard of such a thing. People staying there, wanting to be there for the band. I mean, it was, it was absolutely incredible. And it was also the first opportunity that I had to see the, uh, the, the, the ritual of my way at the end of the performance, right? So during this period, Tom also started the UMass Marimba Band, right? Yeah. Now, do you know why Tom started the marimba band? I mean, this is serious. You know why he started? Because, no, he didn't know shit about marimbas. <laughs> no, I'm telling you. The reason why he did it was he wanted the opportunity to learn. He put the ensemble together so that he could learn, he could write in a new idiom that he'd not really written for before. He was doing the battery, but he'd never been doing the work with the front ensemble. So the marimbas gave him an opportunity to expand his own horizons, and so that he could then write and experiment with things, and then create an opportunity for the students to write and experiment with things. That was the whole idea. He was learning, he was evolving, and the program at UMass was evolving at the same time. Now, I left uh, UMass in the fall of 1984 for one very important reason. I hated the cold. <laughs> could not stand the, I, you guys love it, that's fine, not judgmental. For me, couldn't handle it, so. But I, I would come back. I would go back and forth to visit Tom because we were working on our first book together, Championship Concepts for Marching Percussion. It is the book that's written by Tom Hannum and some, some other guy. <laughs> and I'm the other guy. So I would come up to UMass from time to time to visit with him, and it was September of 1985, and there was a hurricane bearing down on New York City. Hurricane Grace. So I called Tom up and I said, you know what, this hurricane's coming toward us. I'm going to come up to UMass and we can do some work together. He said, come on up. So I got in the car and I drove up to UMass and I get out of the car and Tom said, 
the hurricane turned, it's now coming up the Connecticut River. <laughs> so we're, we're in Amherst and the hurricane's coming at us. And it's like, okay, well, what do we do? Uh, and we decided that we would go into the most stable structure in all of Western Massachusetts, Old Chapel. So we rode out a hurricane in Old Chapel. And what was amazing about it was, as the hurricane passed by, the eye went over Old Chapel. And we walked outside and stood and looked around in the eye of a hurricane outside of Old Chapel. It was an amazing experience until the back end of the wall of the hurricane came in. <laughs> then we got our butts back into Old Chapel and rode it out. So, I mean, it's an amazing, uh, amazing time there. But during our final year of working together in 86, Tom could tell that I, myself, was at a crossroads. And he encouraged me to find my next thing. Uh, that I couldn't just be a drum corps dog for the rest of my life. Uh, that I needed to go do something different. So with Tom's encouragement, I left. I left the cadets in 1986 and looked for my next thing. And thus ended our musical collaborations together. So that was the sad part. The happy part was the very next day, I was offered a job interview that would ultimately lead to a job at Pearl Drums. And so our relationship changed again. Now they hired me at Pearl and they put me in charge of developing marching and concert percussion products for the company. But I was a timpani and mallet player. <laughs> and my first task was to redesign the marching percussion, the battery, the snares, the tenors, and bass, and I really didn't know what I was doing, so I called on Tom to work and help me with this redesign process, and we were able to actually use the UMass percussion section as a testing ground for the new ideas that we were bringing up. Because we, if we took it to DCI, everyone's getting all over, what drums are they using? UMass, no one was paying attention. So, and not, I don't mean that derogatorily, but for us it was great because we could do all the experimentation at UMass and no one knew what we were doing. So Tom and I worked together to design the championship series marching percussion for Pearl. We reimagined the concept of what marching tenors are, developed the many carriers, and we capped it all off with the development of this little guy, the FFX snare drum. These designs have dominated the activity for the past 30 years, and in fact, most of the drum designs today in marching percussion have borrowed the ideas that we implemented in the championship series. But not only did he do this for Pearl, he went on to help develop cymbals for Zildjian, and sticks for Vic Firth, and drum heads for Evans, and these are the relationships that have endured over his entire career. You see, he wasn't jumping from company to company looking for the next deal that he could get or next endorsement deal. He was loyal, and this loyalty benefited UMass, where I conservatively estimate that Tom has been responsible for bringing more than one million dollars worth of instruments into this university. Huh? No. So during the, the late 80s and 90s, Tom moved from the Gazettes, where he collected four DCI titles and won his first percussion trophy, to Star of Indiana, where he would collect another DCI championship. That set him on the pathway with Bill Cook and Jim Mason to develop what was first known as Brass Theater, which then evolved into the groundbreaking, Tony Award winning Broadway hit we call. That's right. You can clap for that. <laughs> Who's this guy? Go Nick. Yeah. Where is he? Nick? Thank you. Nick and Jeff Queen, and Jeff Queen were the two stars of Blast. And actually, this is a photo after opening night on Broadway. Right? And you have me and Jeff Queen and Tom and Bobby Dubinsky and Ralph Hardiman and Nick and Dennis DeLucia and Paul Rennick. That's an all-star lineup right there. It really was. 
Now, during this period, our relationship changed again because I left parole and ventured into the area to fight for music and arts education, where I left, went first to NAM and then to Save the Music and then started Music for All. But every step along the way, I watched the band's success, and I watched Tom's success along with it. And Tom evolved as the opportunities around him were presented to him, and so did UMass. Tom's commitment to excellence, his adherence to high standards, and his belief that quality creates demand elevated not just the UMass percussion section, but the entire band. And the combination of Tom's high standards and excellence and George's commitment to high fan engagement and entertainment created a powerhouse. It was this combination that unleashed the power and class of New England on the rest of the country and raised the band to a level of such quality, outstanding performance and reputation that in 1998, UMass was awarded with the Sudler Trophy from the John Philip Sousa Foundation. <laughs> Invitations started to appear from Macy's and then turned into Rosemans, right? And in record, five Bands of America Grand National Championships. No collegiate band has appeared more often. No collegiate band. That's a record, five appearances. So while Tom has had a real impact in education nationwide for 40 years, heading the education program advisory team at Pearl, uh, working with all the education companies, appearing at PASIC, uh, Texas Music Educators, Midwest Band, running the Music for All Summer Symposium for Percussion, and of course his continued work at the DCI level with Crown, where my own son is a drum major and has his own opportunity to learn at the hand of Dr. Hannum. <laughs> and of course, let's not forget that this must be, you know, the mobile percussion seminars, right? Yeah. This has got to be the 125th season of those, right? <laughs> but Tom's greatest achievement as an educator is what he has done here at UMass, right? And what he's done here is impacted the nation. And this is embodied by the brothers and sisters who make up... Give it up. So, it's been the philosophy of Tom to build from within, by meeting students where they are and working with them to improve, as long as they were willing to listen and put forth the effort. This is Tom's formula for success. And nothing embodied this more than spring marching percussion tech class, right? That's the real secret sauce behind this program, where current and aspiring members would intersect and this is where Tom and the team would focus on the developmental needs of each of the individual sections. It is also the laboratory for experimentation for both uh, the concepts in the tech class that would then find their way onto the marching band field and then would find their way from UMass into the highest levels of DCI. You see, UMass percussion develops trends and sets standards that are adopted by DCI, not the other way around, right? And it's something to keep in mind. And as a matter of fact, 2006 alum Lance Piantagini 
once wrote about how Tom students have infiltrated all aspects of the DCI circuit, actually calling it the University of DCI, because there are now more than 50, 50 Tom, 50 UMass percussion folks that have taught or are teaching at the DCI level, right? legacy? That's crazy. But no one knows for certain their true strength until they are tested under fire or through great tragedy. And Tom's greatest personal test came with the passing of George Parks. Not only did Tom lose one of his greatest friends and colleagues, but it happened on the road to one of the most important performances for the band at the University of Michigan. But Tom rose to the occasion, both to help console and heal and lead the band forward. There were many pathways that could have been taken, but Tom guided them gently to the one that would stabilize the band for the next chapter of their history. This is actually a picture of Tom at Collegiate a few weeks after the passing of George. Notice the, the audience on their feet giving a rousing ovation for the organization. He's been tested by the passing of his father and the need to care for his mother and the untimely death of his brother. But through it all, he has remained a dedicated father, a loving son, a caring partner, a loyal friend, <laughs> And now you're checking out all the glasses again, I see. <laughs> and he would continue to pour his heart and soul into this program at UMass. Which brings me to my final point. Oftentimes, people who use their positions with athletic bands, they use them as a stepping stone. That it's a means to an end, a pathway to somewhere else. Not a destination in and of itself. But for Tom, that wasn't the case, never the case. UMass is his home. UMass is his bedrock. This is the place from which he builds everything else. It's the place where he returns, and the people that he always returns to every year. No matter what the other opportunities, whether it's Crossman, Cadet, Star, Broadway, or Crown, all of those things grew out from, grew out of what he does here, what he learns here. He lives his words. The quality that he strove for here at UMass created the demand for him elsewhere. Quality creates demand. And the platform that UMass gives him allows him to continue to push the envelope of innovation and remain relevant long after all of his contemporaries have left the field. The people that Tom taught with in the early 80s, they don't teach anymore. Yet he's still in the game, setting standards, evolving, making a difference. UMass has always been his first priority, and the results of that dedication speak for themselves. His unselfishness and generosity in sharing his talents. <laughs> His unselfishness and generosity in sharing his own talents and gifts with his students and so many of us has not been about band or percussion. It's also been about lessons in life, right? How many of us take what Tom has shared with us and apply it to what we do every day? Right? The lessons of high standards, a commitment to excellence, and the quality creates demand mentality translates into all aspects of everyday life. As the legendary UMass band philosopher, Keith Paul, <laughs> once told me, UMass band alumni have degrees in getting shit done. <laughs>
find our own excellence by giving us the tools and opportunities to get shit done, right? To figure out how to unlock the greatness that lies within each of us. <laughs> These are the gifts that Tom has given to each and every one of us, and I know this because these are the gifts that he's given to me. So I'd like everyone to grab a glass and please rise. <laughs> On behalf of all your friends, colleagues, students, admirers, loved ones, and the tens of thousands of people, both known and unknown, whom you have influenced. Thank you, Tom, for all you have done, for marching percussion, for the Minuteman Marching Band, and for all of us who have had the privilege to call you a mentor, a teacher, an inspiration, a colleague, and above all, a friend. Congratulations on 40 years at UMass. Salute, sir.